everyone. It's so good to be here with you today. And while we're unable to see each other, just wanted to step in to say that we are um, grateful that you can join us. And we pray that the Lord blesses you through this message. Yeah. So, see you soon. Amen. Thanks, Jean. So good morning, church, our friends, our family. So good to be with you again this morning. A few announcements before we get into our study, but uh, so you know where we're going in case you don't. We're in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 20, and what I'm going to do is kill my phone right now so it doesn't uh, disrupt me before we get going. Uh, that's good. Okay. So uh, first of all, uh, Lauren, thank you for the worship music again this morning, and uh, if you have not listened, she put together uh a grouping of songs like she's done every week since we've been uh isolated like this and some good worship music and it's a good way to uh spend some some of the time some of your day just uh thinking about uh how awesome god is and we can certainly do that as we listen to the music that so many uh you know god's given gifted people given them gifts to to worship and uh i so appreciate uh, worship ministry. And that's something we miss. I'm not playing your song. I'm not going to get a piano in here and lead you in any kind of worship. Um, that would get you off of this video in a hurry. So uh, we don't want to do that, but it is good to praise the Lord. So uh, you can find that link on our Facebook page as well. Also want to mention in this time of isolation, um, especially for those of you who live alone, uh, well, that's that's the main thing I wanted to say. I mean, there can be uh, things that get heavy on your heart or troubles, difficulties, whatever it might be. If you need someone just uh, to call and ask some uh, godly counsel, certainly offer that, sure. But if it's just someone to talk to, um, my phone number, 207-466-0114. It's right at the top of our Facebook page. And you give me a call and I'd be happy to to talk with you. Also, if you're you're struggling from some uh, life controlling issue, uh, whether it's uh, chemicals, you know, drugs and alcohol, something like that, that thing, uh, we do have the Arise program, and John and Sadie are certainly ready and willing to speak with you if you need to to speak with someone about uh, those things, or or just want to talk to them about uh, about the Lord. Um, they're more than happy to talk with you as well. So you'll find their name as well and their phone number on our Facebook page. And finally, I uh, do want to mention as well, uh, if you want to uh, join with us in what we're doing uh, with your tithes and offerings, um, if the Lord has put it on your heart to share some of your resources with this ministry, uh, there is a, an address as well that Lauren is faithful to put up that. Uh, uh, where you can mail your gift to, and we welcome that and thank you for it. Those of you who have been sharing in, in the work of this ministry, uh, you're a blessing to the Lord, certainly, but also to us, and we thank you for that. And so just want to let you know that opportunity is there um, if that is something that's on your heart to do. Well, join me in prayer now, and uh, then we'll get into 1 Samuel chapter 20 together, okay? Father God, we thank you for another glorious morning, another beautiful day. And Lord, uh, the hope of, of spring is abounding everywhere as the leaves start to bud on the trees. And Lord, we see the signs of um, spring. The snow is almost gone in my yard, almost gone everywhere in our state and lord we just uh know that uh as we look at those signs lord it gives us hope in this time where we really are so isolated and separated lord we look forward to the day when we can gather together again as a church and pray lord you bring that day soon lord i pray that you would minister to us through your word as we look at it this morning that you would bless our time together and that you'd be glorified in it in jesus name amen so in Samuel, we have been talking about the uh, trials and tribulations of David as uh, King Saul continues for 
for no other reason than envy. He uh, continues to seek to kill David. And what we read about last week was how David fled for his life. He fled to Samuel, probably went there and says, hey, Samuel, you anointed me to be king. You poured oil on my head and um, you said that I would be king someday. And now look at all the trouble I'm in. What's going on? Is is Am I doing something wrong? Have I in, in some way offended God? And I, I think that's the first and best thing we can always do when there's trouble. Lord, is there something in me, something I have done, something I should not have? Uh, let me know, please tell me. And so David, I think that's the reason he went to Samuel. Well, Saul, he hears that David is with Samuel, so he sends a bunch of guys, three different groups of pro uh, people, uh, soldiers, to go and get him, and they each start prophesying. And so that's, uh, they join into the, the worship service that's going on. And so finally Saul's, his idea is, well, you're going to get anything done right. You got to do it yourself. So he uh, heads to uh, Nioth and Ramah himself to get David, to kill David. That's his intent. But he gets there. He gets caught up in the worship service as well. And, and it seems like he's had an encounter with God. And so that's where we left off uh, was all these events in Ramah. And so verse 1 of chapter 20, it says, Then David fled from Nioth in Ramah. Well, Saul has come. He sent all these soldiers. He's had his uh, counsel with Samuel. And he's like, i got to get out of here because the guy that's after me has come here. So he flees. And he went and he found his good friend Jonathan. So David fled from Nioth in Ramah and went and said to Jonathan, Saul's son, his friend, What have I done? What is my iniquity and what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? What have I done, Jonathan? Please tell me. I don't know that I've done anything wrong. My heart is to serve Saul. My heart is to, to be a good soldier for your dad. And I have no idea why he's after me, but he's after me. Can you help me out? Can you tell me what's going on? Uh, what's my sin? What have I done? You know, he says that. What is my iniquity? What's my sin? What have I done that he wants to kill me? Verse 2 says, so Jonathan said to him, by no means, David, you're crazy. No way. Dad's not going to do that. You know, you shall not die. Indeed, my father will do nothing, either great or small, without first telling me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It's not so. David, you're reading it all wrong. You've got it all wrong. Um, yeah, dad sometimes has a little temper, but he doesn't want to kill you. He's not after you that way. You, you're thinking wrong. He certainly doesn't want to do this. And verse 3, though, then David took an oath again and said to Jonathan, you know, he said, your father certainly knows that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said, do not let Jonathan know this, uh, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. It's like, Jonathan, look, your dad knows we're friends. He doesn't want you being all upset. He doesn't want you to know that he's seeking to kill me. He doesn't want you in the loop on this one. But understand, I know for certain, Jonathan, it's just a step. I am so close to death, you wouldn't believe it. And you know what? Aren't we all? We're all always just a step from death. I mean, we don't live that way. We don't think about it often, but, you know, uh, there are so many things. And we think about this little virus going around the world right now that's killing so many. And, and we're just one little germ away from uh, something that could kill us. There are so many ways to die. Um, you know, we, we don't think about it. And I think we would be fearful always if we did. But there is a reality to that. And it's, it's something that we ought to make sure, all of us, am I ready to die? Have I settled things with God? And certainly David has done that. David is a, a, a his whole trust, his whole belief system is based on Almighty God. But even still, you know, not understanding. 
Why is your dad after me? You know, this step between me and death. But have you done that? Have you have you taken care of business with God? Because people die every day, every single day. And someday my number is going to come up. Someday your number will come up. And we need to be ready for that. I'm ready. How do we get ready? We accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That's how we get ready. We repent. We turn to the Lord and we receive from him eternal life, believing that Jesus died on the cross for our sin, believing that he was buried and three days later he rose again. That's it. That's what we do. That belief, that trust in that, allowing him to be Lord of our life. That gets us ready for death. And truly we are all but a step from it. David, he's he's saying, look, John, dad, your dad, he just, he doesn't want you to know what his plan is. That's why you haven't heard anything. But I'm telling you truly, he's after me. In verse four, so Jonathan said to David, whatever you yourself desire, I will do it for you. And so he's a good friend. You know, even though it's his dad that's after David, Jonathan is reaffirming to his friend David, look, I am your friend. and I will help you in any way I can. What can I do for you? What a good friend. What a great friend. It's so good to have friends like this in our life. And I'm sure that was a comfort to David because he's kind of feeling out his friend, Jonathan, too. You know, are you mad at me as well, Jonathan? Do you know what I've done? Is there some reason? And so David comes up with this test. He's like, okay, we've, we've got to figure this out. You're saying your dad hasn't got anything against me, and I hope you're right, and and I really want to believe that. And he has just had this encounter with God, and he's been doing all these uh, this stuff with Samuel worshiping and such up there in Rama, and, and maybe it was just a bad you know bad pizza or something. I don't know, a bad day. He had a bad day, and really doesn't want to kill me. So let's do this test. So verse five says, and David said to Jonathan, indeed. Tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king to eat. It's a feast, and I should be at the king's table. That's where David's place was. He says this, though, but let me go that I may hide in the field until the third day at evening. If your father misses me at all, then say David earnestly asked permission of me that he might run over to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all his family. And if he says thus, it is well, your servant will be safe. But if he is very angry, be sure that evil is determined by him. Therefore, you shall deal kindly with your servant. For you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. You know, we, we, we made a vow before God that we would be friends. So be my friend um, and let me know. Deal kindly with me. Let me know. Nevertheless, he goes on to say, if there is iniquity in me, kill me yourself. Look, if there's something wrong, just kill me. Or why should you bring me to your father? You don't have to do that. You take care of it. There is a problem. But here's the test. I'm hoping for the best. I hope your dad is, you know, just had a bad day or something. And I'm hoping that the favor that I had with him, uh, you know, I hope that's all been restored. But if not, let me know. If it's something, as I suspect, that he has evil intent toward me, let me know, Jonathan. Um, if I'm wrong, um, so be it. But he said that. He went so far as to say, and if, if Jonathan, I know you want to be a friend. I know we are friends. But if you know of something, and you you deal with it with me right here, right now, you know, uh, verse nine, though, but Jonathan said, far be it from you. For if I knew certainly that evil was determined by my father to come upon you, then would I not tell you? So here he is again, just reaffirming this. David, I don't know of anything. And if I did, I'd tell you. So then David said to Jonathan, well, who will tell me? Or, or what if your father answers you roughly? So how, we got to come up with a plan now. All right, if this is a plan to decide to figure out if Saul does intend to kill me, how are you going to let me know? We got to come up with some some way to do that. And so Jonathan said to David, "Come, let us go out into the field. 
So both of them went out into the field. So they go out, and, and Jonathan has an idea on how he can get the information to him. And so he says in verse 12, Then Jonathan said to David, The Lord God of Israel is witness. When I have sounded out my father sometime tomorrow or the third day, and indeed there is good toward David, and I do not send and tell you, may the Lord do so, and much more to Jonathan. So if, if it's a good report, oh yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure you know. Don't worry about that, David. But then um, he goes on to say, but if it pleases my father to do you evil, then I will report it to you and send you away that you may go in safety. And the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. So David, I'm on, I'm on your side. I know you haven't done anything wrong. I know of no wrongdoing. You've been a, a, a trusted friend. You've been a, a mighty warrior. You've done all these great things for my dad. And it, to my knowledge, there's nothing you've done that should be questioned. But if there is, I'll let you know. I'll tell you. And then, you know, blessing him. And the Lord be with you. May, may God be with you as he's been with my father. I mean, Jonathan sees how God has blessed his dad. Saul doesn't see the blessing of the Lord in his life. But certainly it seems that Jonathan sees it. Well, uh, verse 14 says, And you shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I still live, that I may not die, but you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemies. Now Jonathan caused David to vow because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. So this agreement, this covenant, you know, that David, I mean, it was in that day and age, it was common commonly done when a new king takes over the throne after the uh, other king died, either in battle or old age or whatever happened. But it wasn't, wasn't uncommon for them, uh, the new king, to go in and wipe out the family of the previous king, to do away with everybody that might be a threat to the throne, or as a way to prevent division even in the kingdom, to establish that I'm the new boss, I'm the guy in charge, and anybody that may even threaten my authority, I'm doing away with them. And, and so Jonathan says, look, do this for me. You know, let's, let's have this pact before God. Let's make a covenant, an oath, that my family will be with you and your family would be with me for good, that we wouldn't do anything to harm each other. And David did that. And, you know, we read uh, as we get into 2 Samuel, uh, we find that Jonathan, after Jonathan and, and Saul, they're out of the picture. They've died. David's king. David remembers this. And he asks, and he finds out that Jonathan does have a son. He's living uh, in poverty uh, in, a, in a part of the country that's uh, kind of like the, the other side of the tracks, the, the bad neighborhood or whatever. And he sends, he calls for Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son. and. We can read about that in 2 Samuel 9, um, and you can read about the uh, covenant as being the reason in 2 Samuel 21, 7. Um, but Mephibosheth, Jonathan brings him in, and he, Mephibosheth comes in fearful. But David says, look, your dad, he was my best friend, my best buddy. And look, I don't know what happened and why all this has happened, but I'm restoring property to you, and you're going to sit at my table. I loved your dad, and I'm going to love on you. You know, so this this oath that they took right here, David lived it. David did it. He was for Jonathan and for Jonathan's family, and so they're going to look out for each other. That's what they promise. And David David's word was good. He meant what he said, and he said what he meant. Something good for us always to do. And then this verse 17, you know, now Jonathan caused, again, caused David to vow because he loved him, as, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. And I was just thinking about that. I said this when we first introduced Jonathan and David, you know, that they loved each other, that they were friends, and how there are those that would pervert this, make this something uh, that it is not. 
And you can see how that can happen because in our language, we, we use that word love so casually, you know, oh, I love chocolate, you know. Well, well, in the Greek, they have different words for different types of love, but we use that word for everything. You know, I love chocolate. I, I love my dog. I love my truck. I, I love my wife. You know, I love the Lord. We use everything as being the same thing. And so I can see where someone may get confused here over what it means. But the love they're talking about here is a love for a friend. It's not a romantic love, though. It has nothing to do with that. It's a love that is a self-sacrificing love. It's a love that we have for someone when we say, I would give my life for them. I'd take a bullet for them. And that's what they're expressing one to another here. I would take a bullet for you. Not that they had guns then. I'd take a sword for you, I guess. That's a, the level of dedication and care they had for each other, but it's nothing perverted. It's nothing uh, uh, that you would say is a romantic love. There's nothing like that. This is not that. So they made a vow, they promised. And so then Jonathan um, here said, well, here's how I will let you know. He comes up with an idea. So we've decided, okay, if dad is angry at you, I will tell you, and this is how, verse 18. Then Jonathan said to David, tomorrow is the new moon, and you will be missed because your seat will be empty. And when you have stayed three days, go down quickly and come to the place where you hid on the day of the deed and remain by the stone easel. So he's saying, look, you go to your family. I don't want to tell a lie. I'm going to tell the truth. So you go. And when you've stayed three days, come back here. And you know that stone easel, you know that one that we call easel. Um, be somewhere near there. Verse 20, then I will shoot three arrows to the side as though I shot at a target. And there I will send a lad saying, go find the arrows. If I expressly say to the lad, look, the arrows are on this side of you, get them and come. Well, that's the signal, you know, then as the Lord lives, there is safety for you and no harm. So the signal is come, it's okay. Everything's good. Verse 22, but if I say thus to the young man, look, the arrows are beyond you. Go your way, for the Lord has sent you away. So if I say, no, it's beyond you. They're further. It's the idea that you have to go. So that's the signal. It's either come or it's go. It's a good signal. It's a good, good sign. And, you know, doing that in case there's somebody else around. Nobody else would know what he's doing. It seems like a very natural, normal way to do things. And if I say, you know, verse 22, look, the arrows are beyond you. Go your way for the Lord has sent you away. God is going to use this to show you what his will in the matter is for you. You know what you have to do. Um, verse 23. And as for the matter which you and I have spoken of, indeed, the Lord be between you and me forever. Just continuing to reaffirm. David, I'm on your side. But I was thinking about this. You know, this idea here, it's uh, it's amazing to me that they would have to go to this length, that Saul, because of his insane anger toward David, who's done nothing to him, how crazy that is, you know? It's just amazing, isn't it, that he would seek to kill him. Makes no sense to me. Anyway, verse 24 says, Then David hid in the field, and when the new moon had come, and the king sat down to the feast. Now, uh, now the king sat on his seat, as at other times, on a seat by the wall. And Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by Saul's side, but David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul did not say anything that day, for he thought, Something has happened to him. He is unclean. Surely he is unclean. So if you're unclean, you, you don't gather with other people. You've done something. There's many uh, references to what that could be in the Old Testament, but you don't go and share a feast. But that only lasts for a day. Well, on a day that you've uh, touched a dead body or, you know, the whole list anyway, you're supposed to wash yourself and then in, at evening and then you'll be clean. So it only lasts for a day. So he figured, okay, something's happened to him today. He's unclean, so he hasn't come. He'll be here tomorrow. Verse 27 says, it happened the next day 
the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, why has the son of Jesse not come to eat, either yesterday or today? And see that son of Jesse, I mean, you, you think of what he could have said. I mean, this is using a, a demeaning term. That's what he intended when he said that. That's how we get the, the sense of what he's saying. But he's not happy that David's not there. He calls him the son of Jesse, accentuating his birth. You know, this, this guy who thinks he's something, but he's really from uh, a very poverty-stricken uh, family, um, a low guy. I mean, think of all the things he could have said. Hey, Jonathan, why has my warrior David not come to eat. I mean, think of the terms he could have used. Why has uh, my daughter Michael's husband, David, not come to eat? Or why has your good friend David not joined with us? I mean, so many other ways he could have said it, but he says it this way, to diminish David, to accentuate the, the lowliness of who David should be, you know? And so he asks, and here it is, you know, Jonathan going, okay, here's the test. Verse 28, so Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked permission of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, please let me go for our family has a sacrifice in the city and my brother has commanded me to be there. And now if I have found favor in your eyes, please let me get away to see my brothers. Therefore, he has not come to the king's table. So that's, that's plausible. That could have happened. That was a, a reasonable thing. There wasn't any reason for... Um, that to be uh, out of the ordinary, that is something that could have happened. But verse 30 says, then Saul's anger was aroused against Jonathan. And he said to him, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. You know, it, why is it that he's gonna insult Jonathan and his mother? I mean, what a horrible thing. And I'm sure the language is cleaned up a little bit here, but you know, the, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. That speaks as well to you, Saul, just thinking, you know, but insulting his son. Do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, you shall not be established nor your kingdom. Don't you get it, son? David's going to take the kingdom from you. You should be the next king. Why are you his friend? We got to get rid of him. That's what he's saying here. Now, therefore, send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Well, that's pretty strong, you know. Sorry, sonny boy. He's got to get out of the picture. I'm doing it for you. I'm doing it because otherwise you're not going to have your kingdom established, and neither shall you be established. You won't be the, the person you could be. We've got to put this guy down. You know, so many people do that too. They put someone down thinking that it would exalt them. And actually the opposite is true. When you exalt others and humble yourself, you know, if we humble ourselves, we will be exalted. So it's crazy, the thought here. Well, verse 32, Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said to him, why should he be killed? What has he done? Again, the same thing that David asked. What's the problem? What has he done? Then Saul cast a spear at him to kill him. Boy, that's an intense anger toward David, that he would take a spear. And why would you bring a spear to a feast anyway? I mean, Saul is extremely insecure, it seems. But the fact that he would take that spear, and he's so angry with his son because his son is a friend of David, um, Saul cast a spear at him to kill him, by which Jonathan knew that it was determined by his father to kill David. I mean, Jonathan's going, look, if he's going to chuck a spear at me, he is angry. He is wanting to kill David. What a horrific event. I mean, it was a great feast day, huh? Hopefully that's not how your family celebrates the feast. You all get together and it turns into a big argument. But I certainly have heard of that, and it's tragic when that would happen. It's nice to get together with family, but when it's a celebration and when we get together and we share food, I miss our potlucks. I'm ready for a potluck. I'm thinking once this is all over, we're going to have one, like right off, because it's just so good to get together and share food, isn't it, and have a feast. But nowhere would be like this. My goodness, how awful. 
And verse 34 says, so Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had treated him shamefully. His father should be ashamed. His father should be the one that um, is repenting. His father should, you know, but, but Saul, he just continues to go that way. I don't know what it is in him that he hated David. I don't know why. There was no reason, but he does. He hates him. Well, verse 35 says, And so it was in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David, and a little lad was with him. Then he said to the lad, Now run, find the arrows which I shoot. As the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. When the lad had come to the place where the arrow was which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried out after the lad and said, Is not the arrow beyond you? I mean, you, you can just hear David's heart sink. Jonathan has already been grieving, but David just hoping. You know, he's, he's watching wherever he's hidden, and he's, he's hoping that he would say, get the arrows and come. But no, it's not that. Ah. It's not the arrow beyond you. Verse 38, and Jonathan cried out after the lad, make haste, hurry. Do not delay. So he, he's expressing an urgency in his uh, signal to David. So Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and came back to his master, but the lad did not know anything. Only Jonathan and David knew of the matter. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to his lad and said to him, Go, carry them to the city. And so, as he has said he would be a trusted friend, so he is. And Jonathan signals David, David, it is as you feared. And now think of it for David. Now he becomes a man on the run. He becomes a fugitive. Think of all that he had had. You know, he was in the palace with the king. He was married to the king's daughter. I mean, think of all the, the special privileges. You know, David is, uh, Saul has killed his thousands, but David is 10,000. You know, all these People knew his name, and he was so popular. All of that gone. He's now going to be on the run. And he's got nothing. I mean, what's he got to take with? He has no food. He, has, he doesn't have a weapon. He's just got to run. He's got to leave. And what a tragedy. And I was thinking about that, how sometimes in our lives it's like that. You know, our, our life can turn on just a small thing. He's sitting there wondering, you know, which way is it going to go? Is it... Come back, or is it run for your life, you know, and finds out it's run for your life. Just that one arrow that gets shot that says, no, it's beyond you. You know, that those one small thing, how our life can turn on such a small thing. Um, you know, one careless night, it can happen. And it has happened, and it does happen. And uh, a young no, well, they're not be young. Uh, a man and a woman and, and a pregnancy occurs because of carelessness. Ought not to happen. You know, you, you let your guard down. You shouldn't be alone together, but you are. And this happens. And that changes everything. You know, this one small thing or, or one night out with the, the wrong crowd. And you get introduced to maybe drinking or some drugs and you know, these things that seem casual to your friends, they have deep hooks that get into you, and it changes everything. And your life becomes consumed by this thing that you thought would be just a, a fun night with some friends. But it's the wrong crowd, and the wrong thing happens. Or, or a moment's distraction, and the car goes off the road or runs into another. You know, that idea. It's amazing how our life can be a series of little things. And it just turns on small moments like that, little moments, but not always bad things. Either good things happen that way too, you know, that um, you happen to, to go into this place that you had no intention of going to, and there you meet the person that will end up being your spouse. Just on a, a happen, happen chance, you know, a God appointment type thing, or, 
or you apply for a job that you have no business even applying for and you get it and there you know opportunities open up for you that you had no idea would come your way um so many ways our lives are impacted by just small things isn't it isn't it crazy uh and i think of that you know so many people they end up serving the lord because someone said to them hey why don't you go to church with me today and you decided to go they decide to go just on that little invitation and their whole life is transformed certainly that's happened in my life probably in your life too on the invitation of a friend to hear the word of god and you hear it and it it resonates as truth and you've responded to that what an amazing thing but here with david here with jonathan what a tragic event one event let them know that, you know, because of Saul's extreme anger and rage at this feast, Jonathan knows, and he communicates to David, you got to get out of here. You've got to go. You, you must be gone. Well, verse 41 says, as soon as the lad had gone, David arose from a place toward the south, fell on his face to the ground, and bowed down three times. And they kissed one another, and they wept together, but David more so. So expressing their friendship, weeping together, David more so, because, you know, Jonathan has lost a friend, and that's that's something to cry over. There's something to grieve over. But think of what David has lost. He lost his friend. He lost his position. He's losing his wife. He's losing everything. He can't have contact with his family anymore. There'll be spies looking out for that. You know, Saul is going to want to know, where is he? He's after him. So his, his despair. Um, verse 42, then Jonathan said to David, go in peace. What a great thing to say. I know dad's angry at you, John, uh, David, but I'm not. Go in peace. You know, they, in scripture, it only tells us of one more time where they briefly meet just before Jonathan's death. death. Such good friends, but now separated. But he says, look, go in peace. I'm your friend. You go. Go in peace. Since we have both sworn in the name of the Lord, saying, may the Lord be between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. So he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. I'm sure the heartache as they depart. And you have to ask, you know, one of the questions that would come up when you read a uh, uh, an account. I like to call it an account, a historical account. This actually happened. This isn't a story. This is a, a history. But why would God allow this? Why does God allow these things? You know, was David in God's will? I, I think so. I don't think David was doing something uh, apart from the will of the Lord. He was walking in God's will, and yet all this trouble comes upon him. So yeah, he's in God's will, but I think this was a time, we know it from what we can read in scripture. It, it, it was a time of preparation for David. And so it is with us. Sometimes we have to go through things and we don't understand it always, but God understands it. We need to trust him. You know, God knows what's going on. Following the Lord is not always easy. I mean, difficulty does come. You know, Jesus even said that. In the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, he said. You know, focus on him. We can be of good cheer, for he's overcome the world. So through this time, David learns to rely on God alone. And that's a great lesson for him to learn. As he goes through these years of running from Saul and hiding from Saul and all the trouble that we're going to read about as we continue in 1 Samuel, um, through it all, he doesn't turn his back on the Lord. He stays following the Lord, and he learns to rely on the Lord. David learns humility and submission to God's authority. He allows the Lord to be Lord. What, a, what an example. You know, that's why scripture says David was a man after God's own heart. Because even though he goes through all these trials and all these troubles, and even though we can read in Psalms where there was despair and discouragement, you know, as he writes these Psalms, we see how he would call out to God, help me, help me, Lord, you know, as he should. But still, through it all, he relied on the Lord and the Lord was faithful. 
It's a, a great story that we will continue to read. But I want to close with this idea. Uh, I got this from Alan Redpath, this, this statement, quote, let God empty you out that he may save you from becoming spiritually stale and lead you ever onward. He is always calling us to pass beyond the thing we know into the unknown. A throne is God's purpose for you. A cross is God's path for you. Faith is God's plan for you. I, I just like that. I thought that's a that's a good uh, good insight that Alan Redpath had. Let me read it again. Let God empty you out that He may save you from becoming spiritually stale. That's something we don't want to be. And lead you ever onward. He is always, always calling us to pass beyond the thing we know into the unknown. God always wants us to grow. And, but we've got to keep these things in mind. And I, this is what I liked about it. A throne is God's purpose for you. God wants to exalt you. And as we humble ourselves before him and serve him, he will do that. So a throne is God's purpose for you. But a cross is God's path for you. And faith is God's plan for you. So keep that in mind. Let us trust the Lord, um, come what may. Amen? Well, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for all your good thoughts toward us, for your mercy and for your grace. I pray your blessing on my friends this day. And Lord, till we come back together again, I pray that you would keep them safe. Bless them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we'll see you again soon. God bless you.